Uh, okay, great. Well, hello, and uh, hello from the internet. <laughs> um, this is uh, Tim Huang. Talk today is titled uh, Horses to Water. Uh, and uh, it's uh, excited to be here as part of the Blip uh, Hackathon. Um, and it's a uh, talk uh, to address kind of momentarily uh, a question that I've been thinking a lot about, um, specifically into the realm of something that's pretty overlooked usually when we talk about legal technology uh, and sort of specifically disruptive legal technology, and that's kind of the question of uh, adoption. Um, how do the things that we're working about and thinking about uh, and percolate kind of the rest of the world? Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the cool things that are happening, uh, the, the bad things that are inhibiting that, uh, and talk about some solutions potentially. Um, so first off, by, by way of introduction, um, as John mentioned, uh, my name is Tim Huang. I'm a junior partner at the law offices uh, of Robot, Robot and Huang, uh, which is a San Francisco research and development uh, firm that basically works on intersections of uh, computer code uh, and legal code. And that's a little abstract, so um, to give you a sense of concretely what we're working on, um, we're about to release a Python toolkit uh, that basically allow you to uh, use code basically to programmatically uh, legal entities to uh, behave in certain ways. And you're able to stitch that toolkit in with various uh, kind of computer programs. So it could be like, if there's uh, something that happens on Twitter, uh, initiate uh, uh, the closure of a company, or transfer an asset, uh, or create a subsidiary. And it is to create a toolkit that allows people to kind of play with a uh, law particularly this way. Um, as uh, John mentioned, I was a researcher at the Berkman Center for a few years, specifically working in uh, uh, with Professor Bjorka Benkler uh, into how sort of the design of websites influences kind of overall sort of collaborative behavior. Um, and then uh, most finally, the thing that's actually taking up a lot of my time right now is uh, I'm, I'm the founder of a conference called RaffleCon, as John mentioned, which uh, brings together people who are momentarily famous on the internet to talk about web culture uh, and the spread of memes online. Um, so the guy on the left is Tron Guy. Uh, if you haven't seen him yet, definitely worth checking out. Uh, he's, he's pretty, pretty profound. Uh, uh, just to jump into it, uh, let's talk a little bit about the great things that are happening. Um, I think one of the most striking things, even in the last six months, has been the fact that uh, the Blin Hackathon is really not alone in a number of ways. Uh, in the last six months, we've seen kind of an upswell of hackathons around the law. And what's interesting is that they're actually kind of distinct from what's come before. Um, the, the precedent for doing a kind of lot of legal, legal, legal hackathons were kind of around the Gov, kind of Gov 2.0 space, right? People who are looking into kind of government transparency. Uh, and, uh, and sort of government openness. Uh, but what's interesting about the new kind of brand of legal hackathons that are popping up all over, really, um, is kind of this focus on sort of the ethos of the legal hacker on one hand, uh, and then also uh, the kind of idea of looking broader uh, at just more than just things than sort of government transparency, uh, to think about a little bit more about how sort of people interact with law more generally and, and kind of active experiments uh, sort of in that vein. Um, this sort of emergent sort of trend has been accompanied by this really interesting thing happening uh, in the private sector as well. So, democracy, as you heard from this morning, uh, but also a number of other kind of startups that are popping up around sort of disruptive legal technology. So, Lex Machina, which is kind of a really interesting company happening in the Bay Area, uh, focuses on sort of data mining patent litigation outcomes, right, to do predictive work. Um, Ripto, which is a fairly new company in LA, uh, focuses on sort of automated. Uh, contract checking and contract evaluation. Um, and so there's sort of events that are starting to collect all these. Uh, Robot Robot Huang does one called the uh, New and Emerging Legal Infrastructures Conference. And we've just actually seen more and more of these sorts of things over time. So you've got sort of the emergent world, so you've got sort of the commercial world, and then you've also got kind of the academic world as well. So um, there's some interesting project coming in and sort of, you know, data thing and actually playing with, with sort of legal data. And so uh, this is by Dan Katz over at the University of Michigan that, that is actually quite fun, but basically allows you to track the frequency of firms uh, through the sort of history of Supreme Court opinions from 1800 uh, on. Um, and so there's all these really interesting kind of trends happening, right, both on the grassroots uh, and, and beyond. Um, so that's really interesting, but I think one of the big problems, and I want to take some moment to discuss that today, right, is this question of adoption, right? Uh, given that you believe in these technologies, you think they're important trend, um, you know, I think there's no risk that some of these technologies end up fairly inhibited, actually, um, that actually stifled by a number of kind of structural uh, sort of features in the environment. And so I want to kind of talk through the problems and then talk, think a little bit about what the alternatives uh, might actually be. I mean, one obvious one, right, which I'm sure potentially has come up in the discussion today, is around the idea of bringing these technologies to legal practitioners in general, right? So you immediately run up against kind of two types of problems, right? There's the problem of 
sort of norms, right? Like that lawyers tend not to be particularly, or tend to be actually particularly kind of risk adverse uh, with regards to technology. Uh, but also the secondary problem of just sort of financial, uh, economic interest as well, right? Which is uh, if you have the billable hour, there's this real problem where uh, you have financial interests that actually keep you from adopting things that would make you more efficient uh, over time. And so a lot of people kind of run up against this wall and, and they've said, okay, well, maybe another alternative is that uh, we try to bring this technology to the public, right? We try to uh, sell to a broader group of people. Um, and uh, one of the bigger problems, right, is, is around the responsible deployment of this technology, right? Like offering these technologies in a way that don't get people into even more trouble than they were before. And also the needs often tend to be a little bit limited in ways that kind of prevent the technology from kind of taking on its full sort of scope uh, and complexity. Um, and so those are two problems, but I think there's also an even deeper problem, right, which touches not only legal practitioners, but also kind of the public at large. And, and that has to do with kind of the financing infrastructure around this, right, where um, if you are a person who finances projects, you do venture funding, uh, there's this kind of issue where it makes more sense to fund Twitter for dogs, right, and flip it in 500 days for a billion dollars, uh, then it makes sense to kind of try to invest the huge amount of money and time that it may to be to take on uh, kind of a centuries old uh, sort of legal profession, right? And so I think these three things actually get us into some trouble, right? Um, if, if these things are truly kind of exciting and things that we want to push forward, these are kind of structural limitations that actually prevent the technology from getting out further. And so um, I've only been given sort of 15 minutes, so I figured I'd take the next few moments to kind of discuss potential alternatives, right? What do you do uh, when the horses are at the water and they don't want to drink? Um, and I think one of them uh, that we've been thinking a lot about here at Robot Robot and Huang Oh, it looks like it rendered a little bit weird there, but the, the essential idea is, well, uh, if the horses don't want to drink, maybe it makes sense to make new horses. Um, and, uh, and the vision here would be uh, that we actually rebuild the, the legal profession or legal firms uh, from the ground up, integrating all these technologies and integrating all these practices. Um, and that extends to, you know, lawyers adopting sort of code and applications and learning to program, right? Um, but I think there's a nice element to this kind of solution where uh, the, the problem is, it, it kind of puts you where your money, where your mouth is, right? If you believe these technologies are truly disruptive, truly going to change the legal profession, then a uh, proper response is just say, go ahead and do it, right? Um, and, and I think that's actually an interesting and, and important model. I think a second one is sort of the adoption of kind of open source uh, approaches and open source methodology, right? So if you feel that people are not going to adopt these technologies for certain reasons, it, it kind of makes sense to, to push the costs of distribution and obtaining the technology to zero, right? And it points to the idea of, of coding structures and releasing them in a way that allows people to study, remix, and share, and build communities, actually, uh, around kind of applications in the law. Um, and I think that's actually a really important potential strategy uh, that, that may be really important in trying to get past these kind of structural problems. And then the final one, I think, is around sort of incubation, right, which is um, to build and think about what sorts of structures allow people to actually work on these sorts of disruptive technologies, right? So you can envision a future in which, you know, the, the financing actually comes from practitioners or other legal startups uh, and helping to create kind of a, a technology ladder that allows to bring things from sort of incubation to kind of broader use, uh, something that doesn't actually exist right now uh, that may be really important sort of social infrastructure, uh, economic infrastructure uh, to allow um, sort of these sorts of technologies, these sorts of really interesting things to take uh, greater root. Um, but I think, obviously, I think one important response to all this is to say, well, you know, we, all of these things are really great and well and good, but they're all sort of midterm to long term, right? So, you know, what can we do right here, right now uh, in the world of uh, Brooklyn today at the hackathon? Um, and I think what that points towards is, is potentially this idea of thinking about and searching for sort of Napster moments, right? Moments in which uh, a really rigid um, system of production, a really, really rigid sort of industry is sort of broken up by the launch of technology. Um, and to basically seek out where those points might be and, and not to think more about legal hacking just writ large in terms of law and technology or uh, the idea that, you know, uh, we should just obtain and do data visualizations but really move to a potential strategy, a potential thinking around kind of tactical design, right? Moving away from something vaguely defined like legal hacker and really moving to something more tightly defined, uh, something akin to kind of legal hacktivism, right? The, the, the premise that you design applications in order to try to move legal practice or people's interaction with the law uh, in certain directions, 
right? And, and the idea is you hope by the generation of many small Napster type moments or one huge Napster moment uh, that you're actually able to kind of disrupt and, and break down a lot of the barriers that are preventing um, this kind of upswell of technology from being adopted, right? Things on the firm level, things on the public level, and, and things kind of in the, the, the sort of financing uh, level as well. Um, anyway, so I figured I'd keep this relatively short and we'd kind of spend uh, the remainder of the time, I know I have 15 minutes, uh, the, the balance of the time, actually on questions. So here's all my kind of obligatory contact information. Um, and, and thanks for your time this afternoon. Hey, Tim. Thank you very hey, much. Hey. Um, you missed a round of applause because the microphone was off. But uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, there uh, doesn't seem to be many. There actually there are some questions up on the Berkman tool. So Tim, why don't you point your browser in that direction? OK, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. And uh, who else has questions for Tim up here? Well, Tim, I would like to hear a little bit more about the um, conference that you um, that you set up and organized, and and you know what you guys learned from that, in, both in the process of setting it up and and how you think people are actually digging into the ideas there. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so uh, it is actually kind of funny. You know, the original idea there was you know there's a number of trends kind of popping up, uh, and we were sort of thinking Ooh, the video is not working here, but. Uh, <laughs> Let's try to see if we can reinitiate that. We can hear you. Hello? We can hear you, Tim. Uh, no, okay, I got it. Never mind. Sorry, it's just a weird uh, Skype thing on my side. So, talk a little bit about the sort of um, the new and emerging legal infrastructures conference. So, it was a conference we kind of put together last year, um, and the idea was really quite basic. Basically, uh, the premise was to invite a bunch of people who were doing sort of small scale, sort of innovative stuff uh, in the legal industry, and moving away from kind of a lot of the stuff that was happening in terms of events um, uh, uh, generally, right? So, like in the legal profession, there's there's discussion around technology and the law, but a lot of it tends to be really focused on like e-discovery, uh, for instance. Um, and, uh, and, and so we kind of brought in a, a group of topics and, and focused less on sort of the trade show elements, right? People trying to sell their tech um, and, uh, and moving actually more to talking about uh, uh, kind of where it's all taking us, right? So we did a whole panel, for example, on sort of a quantitative sort of legal prediction, uh, which was one model. Uh, we did uh, another one sort of on this kind of emerging world around sort of legal uh, sort of finance. Um, and so it was actually really good. We, I, think, I think more events in whatever form they are in this vein is really good just in terms of bringing people together uh, and, and allowing people to actually share ideas and build projects around stuff. So. Well, Tim. Thank you very much, and we're actually kind of pressed for time and catching up here, so I'm going to push on to our next speaker. Uh, we really appreciate you Skyping in, and uh, it was great to hang with you. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Take care.